Our next speaker is our director of horticulture, uh, Greg Page. Uh, Greg was actually um, learned quite a bit working with Doug Ruin at another botanic garden and uh, has been at, at various uh, places, uh, including zoos, doing zoo horticulture, ask them about um, you know, how to deal with, with elephants uh, if you think your deer are bad in the garden. <laughs> um, he also has worked for the uh, prior to coming here uh, uh, a year and a half ago. Worked with uh, uh, Bartlett tree experts at their uh, their uh, research arboretum in Charlotte, uh, where he really dealt a lot with um, IPM, the integrated pest management, how to deal with insects and pests that are in your garden. So much like Doug talked about every perennial you can grow in North Carolina in 30 minutes and Pam talked about every garden uh, in North Carolina in, in 30 minutes, uh, uh, Greg's going to tell you about every pest in the garden and how to deal with it in the next 30 minutes. So turn it over without further ado to our J.C. Ralston Director of Horticulture, Greg Page. Thank you. Everybody hear me? Am I on? Whew. Good, thank you. Um, yeah, I have to talk about the, the not so pretty and the, and the, uh, the stressful part of, of gardening, but that's, that's just part of it. Um, I, I've got a pretty big IPM background. I've done a lot of work with that in most of the gardens that I've worked at. And I wanna talk about a, a sustainable approach to managing those. Um, if you're new to this area, um, I don't want you to be afraid or, or frightened. Um, if I trigger anybody, raise your hand and I'll, I'll pull the reins back a little bit. But just some things that you should know about gardening here um, and in anywhere for that matter. Um, if you've ever gardened in your life, you're gonna deal with things like Doug was talking about, the, the deer, um, the palette of plants that they used to leave alone gets get shorter by the actual minute. So without further ado, I'm going to jump right in. Um, Mark mentioned that I that I <laughs> that I worked at a, an arboretum previous to here, and um, one of the things you deal with with an arboretum, and we're no exception, is having monocultures of things like big collections of of cannas or oaks or maples. And if you build it, if you have it in your garden, things are going to be attracted to that for the good, like hummingbirds and pollinators, but also um, some of the critters that are just trying to get by. They're just trying to live their lives. So um, I used to manage a large collection of oaks and maples, very uh, monoculture centric things. And anything that would affect those would, would come in and, and uh, cause me lots of heartache and, and headache. And we're, we're no exception to that. There's gonna be a, a certain amount of unwelcome guests that are gonna come to your garden, whether you want them to or, or not. So let's, <laughs> let's talk about this guy for a little bit. Um, this is my sister-in-law's house in Charlotte, um, real close to, I mean, they were urban sprawl, as urban sprawl as you could get, not far from Pineville, and just had this herd that would go from neighborhood to, to neighborhood. Um, I lived in Midtown um, Charlotte, and I was home a couple, I was at the house a couple weeks ago, and looked out the backyard, and there's two bucks with big, beautiful antlers just laying in my epimedium beds, not eating the epimediums, but just kind of laying there, just hanging out in my, my little backyard. So they're, they're a problem, not just from a garden perspective, but they carry lots of diseases, a lot of, lots of tick-borne things that are very problematic. And I forget the statistic on, um, you know, from a nation standpoint, the amount of damage they do on highways and cars and things like that. But they're, they're equal opportunity offenders. There's not much they won't nibble on, as, as Doug mentioned. Um, they'll try something if they don't like it. Um, you know, uh, one of the things they do quite frequently Frequently is um, when they're in rut, they'll use their horns to kind of mark their territories. And when I was in Charlotte, it was usually the most rare, unusual plant that I had in the garden. Um, <laughs> I, I had a colleague in uh, the Huntington Garden in California send me a big leaf magnolia from Mexico. It was one of like four in the country. I planted it and the next day they snapped the top off of it and it was laying on the ground. So I think sometimes they're, they're doing that to be spiteful. <laughs> Um, yeah, look how cute this little guy is. Doug, Doug mentioned voles, not moles, voles, but this was a huge pest when I gardened in the Delaware Valley. 
outside of Philadelphia, um, mature trees, small trees, newly planted things, herbaceous, annual, whatever. They do little galleries underneath the ground, underneath the protection of your mulch. If you live somewhere where there's snow, that's another place that they, they like to be, they're protected from, from predators and they feed on your roots. So, you know, here's a, an aforementioned relatively expensive conifer that had been in the ground for about a year. There's not a living root on this thing that ate everything. Um, this was a holly in our rhododendron garden under the cover of, of the leaves and the mulch. Um, we were hanging labels on things and I went to look at a label and the plant just kind of ketered over because um, all of its roots had been, had been destroyed. Um, the best way to control that I learned from here many years ago is if you plant with some aggregate in your soil, um, stalite, or even just some loose gravel, they can't build those tunnels, so they're less likely to, to cause this kind of damage. Um, I've had people call me and ask me because I have mentioned, and I'm going to mention it here, but I'll answer the question. Um, snakes are good predators, but you can't buy snakes anywhere to put in your garden. Um, at Longwood Gardens in Kenneth Square, Pennsylvania, they had cats that worked in some of their gardens, but cats are very opportunistic. They're not going to stay where you want them to stay. So Prevention is a good thing, keeping the plant out of stress, planting it maybe a little bit high, trying that aggregate if you are dealing with voles in your garden. Um, there's baits and poisons. I try to steer people away from those for, for obvious reasons. So what is integrated pest management, um, IPM? It's a, it's a three-pronged approach to managing insects, diseases, and cultural things in your garden. And it usually consists of, of these three things, um, uh, chemical control, uh, biological control, and a cultural control. And which one of those you kind of rely on is gonna kind of be dictated by your, your threshold of tolerance. How much damage, how many insects, what types of diseases can you deal with in your garden before or um, they become aesthetically unpleasing or they're causing more damage. You can rely on those with, a, a, with um, different levels of, of scrutiny and control, but all those things together work really, really well to control uh, most pests. And uh, you can talk to our folks at Lethal Land. They do a really good job with um, the healthcare of, of landscape that they manage and uh, the, the newsletter that, that Mark mentioned, that's really, really good. So some of the, the cornerstones of that are, it's, it's pretty, pretty simple, pretty basic stuff. You know, the first thing you need to do is, is grow and maintain a diverse landscape. Try to stay away from those monocultures that are gonna cause more, more problems. Um, you know, purchasing good, high quality plant material is very important also. Um, conduct regular scouting of your garden. Go out in the garden and look and see what's going on. A lot of times you can catch a problem before it becomes really bad and that's gonna cause you a, a less heartache down the road to, to, to notice something's going wrong with something in the early stages of that. Just like our own health, preventative medicine is, is, a, is, a, 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 is worth a, a ton of, of uh, money in the, in the garden. Um, develop a plan that fits your threshold of tolerance. Are you willing to use some, some chemicals do you want to completely stay away from that? There's lots of cultural things that you can do, but find something that, that fits with, with your threshold of tolerance and, and get really educated about that. Um, know the good guys from the bad guys. You don't want to, to go in your garden and get rid of, of beneficial insects. You want to encourage them to live. So knowing what they look like, what are the beneficials that are going to be working in your garden? And I'll, I'll talk about that in just a minute. And, and be proactive, not reactive. Get, at, get ahead of things. Um, don't pull out the, the big nuclear arsenal from your toolkit first. There's a lots of things you can do before you need to, to go to that, if you need to go at all. And as I mentioned just a few seconds ago, learn about these things. Get educated about them. So threshold of tolerance, um, Mark said that all the speakers here have really, really nice gardens. That's not mine up in the top, but it's not far from that because it hasn't been touched in uh, over a year. But where's your threshold of tolerance? Is it down in the bottom where it's really expertly manicured? Everything has to be in place, every leaf, every flower, um, every pebble in the path, or are you a little bit free and, and loose or, or somewhere in between? That's, that's what I'm talking about with, with threshold of tolerance. 
And when you're going through your garden and you see one of these in your garden, are you going to run to the big box store and, and get your uh, whatever kills whatever and go out and, and, and chemical alley your garden? Or are you going to pick that off and, and, and get rid of it? Or are you going to look that up and see what that is? One of these isn't going to cause a problem. 300, 400 of them? Maybe. Um, this is a hickory horn devil. Um, it's actually a really beautiful moth. They feed on woody trees. It's, it's not a pest. But that's kind of terrifying to, to find that in, in your garden. I have a picture of that on my head somewhere, but I can't find it. <laughs> what if you got hundreds of these crawling all over your roses or all over in your through your perennial garden? Um, again, what, what are you going to do? Um, is this something to be afraid of, or is is this maybe somebody that you want to encourage in, in your garden? And I'll talk about that in just a second. So. Beneficial insects do a lot of good in the garden. Um, you can actually purchase them and release them in your garden, but chances are they already exist there and they're already doing a lot of work. Um, where beneficial insects really work well are kind of in confined environments like greenhouses where there's a little more control where they go. A lot of times when you buy them, they're not gonna stay right where you want them to do, and I'll, I'll talk about that. But there's, there's three types. Um, there's pollinators. Those are ones that pollinate plants in your garden, um, like honeybees, cirsa flies, and all the all the, the bumblebees that are in your garden. There's predators, um, ladybugs. I'm sure we've all heard about those. Those do a lot of good in the garden. Um, lace wings, wasps, and hornets will eat a lot of insects. They're kind of good to encourage in your garden. Um, surfing flies, assassin bugs, and, and praying mantis. Um, those are all good things to have. And then there's the parasitic beneficial insects. Those are insects that feed on other insects. And usually they do that um, by laying eggs on them, which is an absolute horrible way to, to, to die. Um, I also consider parasitic ones of um, wasps will a lot of times will, will go after uh, larvae and things like that. But um, ones that lay their eggs so that their, their larvae have, have some benefits. And we'll talk about all these. So uh, ladybugs, lady beetles, um, everybody knows what that is. Uh, warm and fuzzy, really, really cute, but they're pretty voracious predators. Um, you can see here, um, this adult is, is going after these aphids and they pick them up. They've got mouth parts that suck all the juices out of them. They'll throw it down and they'll pick up another one. Um, really, really good videos on, on YouTube if you're interested in that stuff. If you're not, it could be nightmare fuel, but um, these guys do a lot of good in, in the garden, um, and they're, they're good to have around. Um, these are what their eggs look like, so that's something to, to look at when you're kind of scouting and monitoring your garden. Um, tight little clusters all close together, uh, usually on the underside of the leaf. And isn't Mother Nature amazing? Um, these guys are smart enough to know that if I lay these eggs um, where there's some, some food, where there's some uh, Chick-fil-A's close by, they're gonna, when those eggs hatch and the larvae come out, they don't have to go very far to, to get food and start doing a lot of good in the garden. So um, pretty, pretty smart, but something to look at. You know, if you were to take a, a product like a horticultural oil to kind of smother those aphids, you're gonna, you're gonna kill those ladybug uh, eggs also. And here's what the larva looks like. Um, this, is the, this is the part of that insect's lifestyle that does the most good as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely voracious. They're trying hard to bulk themselves up so they can become adults and they can mate and they can continue that, that life cycle. But um, you, can, you can see, same, same, picking those up, those big pinchers are grabbing them, pulling them into their face and plopping them down. Um, they do a lot of good in the garden. One that's often overlooked, but a really pretty insect um, from the adult stage is a green lacewing. They will feed on, on insects, but not as much as the, the larva does. And there's a whole family of lacewings. This is probably the most common one in, in our gardens. And again, um, here's what the eggs look like. Um, I, was, I learned this when I was in school. as like little tennis balls on a, on a string. And what the reasoning behind this is they've evolved to um, keep these eggs away from predators that might feed on them. You know, insects aren't super smart. They may travel along and never look up, and up above them are, are the eggs kind of kind of doing their thing. And again, very opportunistic, laying, laying their eggs near where there's gonna be sources of, of, of uh, food. These are some woolly aphids that when those eggs hatch out and the, the larvae um, develop, they've got food that's ready and, and willing right out the, right out the front door. 
So here's the dynamic where um, it's hard for beneficials to get caught up. And if you use something like an insecticide and you wipe everything out, the beneficials will never catch up to the, to the, the bad insects. So the average lifespan of an uh, adult aphid is about one month, month with sexual maturity reached in four to 10 days. That's, that's a pretty quick turnaround. And you can see on the chart there, it takes much longer, um, two months, for something like a lace wing to get to that point where it can reproduce itself. So the balance is, is uneven. Um, the bad insects are gonna outperform, outgrow uh, much more quicker. So it, it's good to keep that balance kind of in check and allow both to, to, to coexist. <laughs> the aphids are very prolific. So here's the green lace wing larva. And um, again, apologies for the nightmare fuel, but you can see those big pinchers right there. And um, we had a video of this in my last job that uh, I need to get my hands on it because it's just such a great uh, teaching thing. But they will scamper along through the aphids and grab them, suck the life out of them, throw them down. Sometimes they'll put them on their backs as kind of camouflage. <laughs> so you see these things working through aphids with little bodies hanging off the top. It's, it's quite graphic. Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but I watched a lot of monster movies when I was a kid. <laughs> That's why I like this stuff so much. Um, everybody first jumps to this guy when they think of beneficial insects. And um, they do eat a lot of insects, but they're pretty lazy and opportunistic. Um, I've seen these things, I've got a good friend in Charlotte that uh, um, has bees, and these guys will set up shop outside of a beehive and grab them as they're going into the, into the beehive. Um, there's also some horrible photos and, and videos of these guys grabbing, grabbing hummingbirds, because they can, they can get quite big. Um, they can do a lot of good. You can buy these and release these to the garden. I'm not gonna go in the, into the details of the, uh, the dynamic of them eating each other. Um, I've seen them do that as they're coming out of the, the egg mass. The, the brothers and sisters are eating their own, uh, own siblings. Um, they're very lazy and opportunistic. I steer people away from, from praying mantis. They're cool to see in the garden. Um, there's lots of different species around the world. They're really, really beautiful insects. Um, they freak me out a little bit because they turn their heads when they're looking at you, but um, not, not the best beneficial insect to get. And I steer people away from, from buying the egg masses to, to release into their garden. So I talked about the, the good guys. Let's look at a few bad guys that you may encounter um, here in, in North Carolina and, and beyond. Um, and I'll go into the details of, 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 of some of these. Um, right now, we're seeing a lot of scale activity in a lot of our urban trees. Um, it's an insect that is attracted to plants and stress. So if you think about trees in parking lots or in our gardens that aren't getting enough water, they've got too much mulch on them. This is an insect that comes in and starts to cause damage. So gloomy scale is one that's been around for a while. You see it a lot on maples and, and things in those kind of urban situations. Um, it's something when it gets to this point that yes, there's insecticides that work. Um, you can manually squirt some of these off with a high pressure hose, which interrupts the life cycle. You can use things like a horticultural oil Oil, which covers them up and keeps them from respiring. Those are what I tell people to do um, on, the, on the front end. The easiest thing to do is buy a good quality plant, plant it at the right depth, give it all the right cultural things, and you'll avoid 90% of this, this sort of thing. Um, we get asked about this probably more than any insect or disease problem, the crepe myrtle bark scale. This is an introduced insect from Asia that I think came into Texas and is rapidly moving its way through here. Um, I was just at the airport a couple weeks ago and passed a whole line of beautiful crepe myrtles that were just covered with these. And what people usually notice first is um, this is an insect that isn't very terrestrial. It stops in one point, has very large, large mouth parts and it starts feeding on the on the sap of trees with a protective coating over it usually and that sap produces a lot of sugar their waste material produces a lot of sugar and this sooty mold this black fungal growth comes in and that's what people usually notice first is what's all this black stuff on my tree and they're not seeing that that insect right right off the bat so this is what it looks like when it's going full guns um, pretty easy to see on crepe myrtles again it's something that's 
uh, attracted to stress. And one way to avoid this is not plant crepe myrtles. Um, I like crepe myrtles. They're a good plant in, in urban landscapes. Um, you know, this kind of ties into the right plant, right spot. I'm not going to go into the pruning of the crepe myrtles, but that's something that encourages these. But it's, it's a monoculture thing. There are so many of them in the landscape now. This, this pest has a lot of things to, to feed upon. So these are, these are the adults. They're, they're doing their damage. Um, these are terrible pictures, but it's hard to take pictures. I, I stole these from my colleagues. Um, and underneath the egg, these are the crawlers. This is the stage that when they, when the egg, the female dies after she lays her eggs, so these guys are protected under these white coatings. They emerge out of here, and this is called the crawler stage. That's the best stage to, to treat them, to get rid of them, because they're moving around, they're vulnerable, they don't have that protective coating, and they're gonna go out and find spots to set up camp, and then they'll start to form this waxy coating that, that protects them. There are beneficial insects that feed on those. Um, I think right in this photo, there's a wasp down here that's feeding on them. But a really, really bad insect. Um, stresses the plant out, the aesthetics of it with all that black sooty mold. Um, there's been some research that shows spraying them off with water when you first find them is kind of a good first step. So this is one that I, I see a lot more and um, have been getting more questions about. This is the orange stripe oakworm. This is a late summer, early fall insect that feeds on what plant, would you guess? Oaks. And again, it's one of those things that you don't notice um, until you look up and see large colonies of these. I had a really nice oak across the street from me that the city planted in Charlotte and all the trees in the neighborhood get them. When they got on that tree, I could reach it with my pruners and I would just cut them off and just step on them. And that would keep them from going through the, the tree. Um, this is what the moth looks like. It's actually kind of pretty. And it lays its eggs on the underside of the, the, the leaf. And when people notice them is when they start raining the droppings down. You'll see that on the sidewalk. And they'll say, what's that all over my sidewalk? And it's the droppings of them feeding on the, on the leaves. When they eat everything that they've started, they get terrestrial. They start to move around and look for other things. But if you see that on your sidewalk or patio, you've got orange stripe oakworm up in your tree. Easy to get rid of, just pruning them out if you catch them at that early stage, going back to being proactive. Gonna talk about a couple of uh, introduced things that have become a problem. Uh, the emerald ash borer feeds on ash tree. This was in, introduced from Asia, and it's pretty much decimated the ash um, nursery trade. And in the Midwest, you don't see this as a street tree anymore because it just went through uh, and just destroyed uh, that canopy and the urban canopy. It's in North Carolina, but we don't have as much of a, an urban street canopy of ash like other people do, and it's an insect that if you've got specimen trees, uh, chemical controls are, are a way to kind of get them at bay. And I think it's one of those things because it's gone through so quickly, the population has crashed, they don't have enough food, and it's not as, as big of a problem, but it is something that's out there. And if you have a prized ash in your neighborhood, it'd be worth it to talk to um, the, the folks at Leaf and Lamb about ways to, to keep that from becoming a problem. <clears throat> but it tunnels in, it kills the vascular tissue, Ashes are very fragile and they just absolutely fall apart when this insect attacks them and they, and they become very, very unsafe. A lot of questions uh, recently about um, ambrosia beetles. That's another insect that causes a lot of damage and it's attracted to plants that are in stress. Um, one of the research projects I was a part of in Charlotte was looking at lightning struck trees. And usually this is what killed lightning struck trees, not the lightning because that tree gets stressed out by the lightning and the uh, produces pheromones Moans, this insect picks it up and attacks that tree and it's in its vulnerable stage. But it tunnels galleries inside of trees. It'll uh, form a fungus that the larvae eat on. When those larvae emerge, that's when they cause a lot of damage that kills that vascular tissue. So nurseries are really bad and a good haven for them because those plants are usually under stress. And you see these frass tubes. This is just the sawdust as they're feeding and they're pushing it out behind them. Um, and that's a sign that those guys are inside doing, uh, doing bad, bad stuff to your plants. <laughs> Um, this is one that's got a lot of attention in the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic spotted lanternfly. It's 
actually a really pretty insect. Um, another introduced thing that if you build it, they will come. It has a very, very broad host range and it attacks things in mass. And it also, when it's feeding, produces a lot of sugar in their waste and you get that sooty mold. Um, I've seen these in the Philadelphia area and you can actually hear them chewing on the trees at night. It's, it's, a, it's, it's again, nightmare fuel, but you can just rake your hands down the sides of the trees and just scoop those off. They're absolutely disgusting. Um, it's getting a lot of attention because it eats grapes and they're worried if it gets to California, it's gonna cause a lot of damage. But, um, and it also likes to lay its eggs on things that are rusty, so trains and car bumpers, and that's kind of peripherates it and spreads it around. But you can see the, the sooty mold underneath a, a tree over there on the, on the right that's produced by um, its, its droppings. So this is where it is as of October. And it has been found here. We're right there, but not populations that have people scared yet. It's also found down in Charlotte and Gaston County, but it's, it's coming this way. It's just kind of a matter of time before it moves down through here. So there's something to, to, keep, uh, to keep on your radar. Um, I talked about stress in plants and uh, our climates have changed. Our plant zone has changed twice in the, the last 10 years. Um, this is last August and that causes a lot of stress which makes our plants more susceptible to insects and diseases. So doing cultural things is, is absolutely crucial. The crazy swings in the weather, you know, it was 14 degrees a couple weeks ago and we reached I think 70 uh, last Friday. That big swing causes things to push too early and I'm a big fan fan of magnolias, but there's nothing more heartbreaking than magnolias because they flower and the cold turns the blooms to that. Or I had some brand new plants a couple years ago and they started to push and we had a freeze and the bark just fell off the trees because it froze. And uh, cold damage is, is, a, is a real problem uh, when, when we deal with gardens. So those big swings in our, our weather, um, we've been prone to floods as of late. Um, this is uh, uh, the Fayetteville area a couple years ago after a big hurricane event. So th these all these things cause stress to the plants in our garden and what are some easy ways to kind of kind of manage that um, and this is the easiest thing to do is just good cultural care um, you know a pound of prevention is worth a pound of cure or an ounce of prevention um, the, one of the simplest easiest ways to have good healthy plants is to mulch them three to four inches that good organic matter helps keep the moisture around keeps compaction away from the trees and uh, as that organic matter breaks down it helps improve the soil so something as simple as that is going to help keep your plant healthy <coughs> They help preserve the temperature. All, all those things are, are, are crucial to having healthy plants in the landscape. Um, the second easiest way to kill anything other than planting it incorrectly is giving it too much water. Um, and you know, there's no rule of thumb better than, you know, if mother nature doesn't supplement, you know, with every, every 10 days, five to 10 days, then, then a little bit of water. And we try to tell people to water, um, Deeper, not frequently, let that water soak into the soil, but less is more when it comes to, to watering. It's better to underwater than, than overwater. And plant quality is, is absolutely crucial. Find good garden centers, champion those people, um, come to our plant sales, get plants from Plant Delights. Those are gonna ensure that you're getting good quality plants. That helps eliminate some of that. And this is a whole nother talk within itself, planting at the right depth, disturbing that root ball so that those roots go out and you are gonna start with a, a healthy, happy plant. And you know, diversity in your landscape, having a lot of different things, different layers of plants for those beneficials to hide and to live and birds to be in and, and having tolerance for you're gonna have bad soil, you're gonna have insects that come in, you might have deer uh, zip through your garden and just kind of managing those things and be tolerant. <coughs> Excuse me, I steered away from a, a disease heavy talk because uh, this was all kind of doom and gloom, mm. but um, I hope that you'll look at some of these resources for more information on, on all those things. Um, Mark mentioned our, our cooperation with the Cooperative Extension. One of the best ones in the country is right here in North Carolina. Great resources. And shoot me an email if you have a question about something, um, insect disease wise, whatever. We're, we're happy to help and um, I'm gonna end with that. Thanks for your attention. <laughs> <laughs>